is Mark Lamia. Hit it! Welcome to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. I'm your host, Mark Gunn. The views expressed on this program are those of the host and guests and not necessarily reflective of anyone or any entity associated with this broadcast. This episode, America's 400-year case of PTSD. January 6, 2021 will forever be remembered as the day that some Americans committed treason as thousands of Donald Trump supporters, QAnon conspiracy theorists, and white supremacist groups stormed the U.S. Capitol in an effort to overturn a duly confirmed national election. Flash forward several weeks later, and as more arrests are being made, more stories are starting to come out about the trauma that those were under attack went through. Earlier this week, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez shared her experience. But the story doesn't end. Um, It's a Capitol Police officer. There was no partner. Was not yelling, you know, Capitol Police, et cetera, et cetera. But then what, but then it didn't feel right. um, Because he was looking at me with a tremendous amount of anger and hostility. And um, things weren't adding up. Like there was no partner there. At first, you know, in, in my brain and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I just came from this super intense experience just now. Maybe I'm reading into this, right? Like maybe I'm projecting, um, maybe I'm projecting like something onto him that, that like maybe I'm just seeing anger, but maybe he's not trying to be angry. Um, but I talked to G, my legislative director, after the fact, and he said, no, I didn't know if he was there to help us or hurt us either. For Cortez, the attack was especially problematic because it triggered another trauma from earlier in her life. Um, I'm a survivor of sexual assault, Um, and I haven't told many people that in my life, Um, but when we go through trauma, Trauma compounds on each other. She goes on to talk about the steps she took in order to protect herself. I hide back in, um, in the bathroom behind the door. And then I just start to hear these yells of, where is she? Where is she? And I just thought to myself, they got inside. It felt like my brain was able to have so many thoughts in that moment um, between these screams and these yells of where is she, where is she? And so I go down and I just, I mean, I thought I was going to die. As it turns out, she ended up hiding in Congresswoman Katie Porter's office. If you've ever seen Congresswoman Porter work, she is as tough as nails and takes no from anyone. And this case was no exception. First, she, you know, she saw me um, she, and we waved and went into my office. And a couple seconds later, she knocked and she said, you know, could we could we come in? And I said, of course. Um, and she began to, uh, you know, her staffer was trying to describe what had happened. And Alex is, re- is really usually like unfailingly polite um, and very personable. And she wasn't even really talking to me. She was opening up doors and and I was like, can I help you? Like, what are you looking for? And she said, I'm looking for where I'm going to hide. And the thing that will always stay with me, the two memories that really, you know, especially as a mom, I think were just really powerful for me was when she said, you know, I, I was saying, well, don't worry. I'm a mom. I'm calm. I've got everything here we need. We could live for like a month in this office. And she said, I just hope I get to be a mom. I hope I don't die today. Porter continues. She was wearing. Um, heels. And I remember her saying to me, I was wearing flats. And I remember her saying to me, I knew I shouldn't have worn heels. How am I going to run? And we went and we found her a pair of sneakers to wear from one of my staffers so that she could run if she needed to literally run for her life. One of the biggest issues in dealing with a trauma like this is the unknown. 
One question being, about how long did you end up being holed up in your office? About six hours. There was no communication about what to do. No one came to check on us. The Capitol Police never accounted um, for every member's safety. And so we heard voices in the hallway. Um, we didn't know what they were, whether those were police officers, whether those were intruders. Um, and so we just, we stayed dark. We clicked the windows um, and the curtains. We turned our phones off. We silenced everything. And we just sat, um, you know, as still and as quiet as we could be in the hope that they would just run on by. There was a severe lack of communication on the part of the Capitol Police. And it was dumb luck that Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez ended up in Katie Porter's office. When they evacuated the Cannon office building, they did not provide anywhere or any direction for those members to go shelter. They told them that there was a bomb threat, that they needed to immediately evacuate their offices, but they didn't tell them where they could go to be safe. And so in addition to sheltering Alexandria, we also had a staffer, a, fr a friend of mine's um, chief, who had been thrown out of their office in Cannon and didn't know where they could go to be safe. And so we obviously let her come in too. We were willing to let anyone come hide there with us um, to keep them safe. But the lack of any safe place when they evacuated these people was really a problem. In the weeks that followed the attack, it's been revealed that there may be several Republican congressmen and women that were directly involved in the insurrection. And to add insult to injury, you've got those that were siding with Donald Trump into pushing the big lie that the election was stolen that are telling Cortez and other Democrats, just get over it. Now, that's like telling a rape victim to just forget about it and move on. Anyone that knows anything about mental health will tell you that there are mental scars that these congressmen and women and Capitol Police and everybody that was at the building that day will have to deal with. And part of the healing process is holding those that were responsible for the attack accountable. Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and any other Republican that participated in, like I said before, the big lie. Which is why Trump is going to be tried on his second impeachment. However, you've got a bunch of Republican cowards that are pushing back, trying to claim that it's unconstitutional to try a president once he's left office. Uh-uh. It's been done before. So we're dealing with a dramatic case of post-traumatic stress disorder. And Dr. Daniel Bover, a forensic psychologist, talks about what the victims will be going through. Well, you know, for the people that were there, I mean, certainly it was a traumatic experience and they probably felt like their life was in danger. So they're going to have to live with the residual effects of that, uh, which are, could be very severe. Um, you know, the Capitol is the symbol of our democracy and to see it stormed uh, and attacked by rioters is probably something we never thought we would see. So I think it's not only traumatic to the people that were there, but the people who witnessed it even on television. A post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is defined as an anxiety problem that may develop after a traumatic event like combat, crime, accident, or natural disaster, triggered by memories, flashbacks, or nightmares. And given the pandemic, and a lot of Americans at home watching this in real time, does it have an effect on the average person, even if he or she weren't there? It does, because, you know, these images are very disturbing and they're not something that people see, obviously, every day. Uh, also, if you have a history of your own trauma, uh, these images can actually trigger you and reactivate that sense of impending doom. So it's really something that's not unusual, given the severity and intensity of the situation. Um, I think it really makes sense. And because of everything involving the pandemic... It feels like it's one trauma on top of another trauma, like it's just piling on. I mean, absolutely. There was really never any good time for this to happen. But with the social isolation, the economic devastation, the illness itself, uh, this was really the perfect storm. Um, and it has been very traumatizing for people. Seeing as how this is the perfect storm, how do you know if you're not handling this well? What are some of the signs that you need to look out for, either in yourself or your loved ones? So you really have to look at people's daily functioning, right? Are they sleeping? Are they functioning at work? And all this is compounded by the fact that so many people are doing things online now that it may not be as apparent as when they were actually going into a physical structure. So I think anything that is affecting people in a way that they can't you know, go through their normal routine, whether that's work or school or interpersonal relationships, then I think it's time to seek professional help. Seeing as that we're spending a lot more time online, we're being deluged with a lot of information. 
Now, for media professionals like me, this is my job. My job is disseminating information, so I have coping mechanisms to deal with it. But for the average person, here are some tips that you can use in case you feel like you need to take a breath, get away from all of it. Some good tips are to limit your information on social media or news exposure that you may find disturbing or traumatizing. Make sure that you're exercising, that you're getting plenty of sleep, and that you are you know, practicing mindfulness either through yoga or meditation. And I think it's also important to make a gratitude list of the things that, you're, um, that you have gratitude for. So all these things are things I think that will be helpful to trying to navigate this stress. Another great way to cope is to isolate yourself in a different kind of way. Try taking a walk in the woods or on the beach when very few people are there. Put yourself in a different type of isolation where your surroundings are a lot more spread out and they don't include four walls. And if that doesn't help, please seek professional help from a mental health counselor. Given these days and times, there are plenty of capable practitioners who can help you through your crisis. Coming up, a mental health issue that is so uncomfortable for most Americans to deal with that it's gone untreated for the last 400 years. Although slavery itself has ended, the after effects still linger. Chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee, Kafra Kambon, says it has caused mental damage, which has passed from generation to generation. He says in some cases, it also causes people of African descent not to accept who they are and embrace their culture. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, coming up on Gunshots Straight from the Hip. If you're an advertiser, one of the most important things about getting your message out is actually standing out from the rest of the crowd. If you're listening to this program right now, this is where you'd hear your commercial. As an exclusive sponsor of Gunshots Straight from the Hip, your commercial is professionally produced and gets a longer shelf life based on your needs. Gunshot Straight from the Hip is a unique and compelling program unlike anything else in the marketplace. Episodes are available for download on iTunes, TuneIn, and MarkGunMedia.com. And depending on how you tailor your message, the potential for new and repeat customers is that much greater. Best of all, it's extremely cost effective. If you'd like more information on how you can be a sponsor of this broadcast, call Mark Gun Media Inc. at 502-407-0283. That's 502-407-0283. Or log on to markgunmedia.com. For downloads of this and past episodes and information about all the multimedia services we offer, log on to our website at www.markgunmedia.com. That's markgunmedia.com. Welcome back to Gunshot Straight from the Hip. I am your host, Mark Gunn. And remember, you can subscribe to us no matter where you listen to your podcasts. And if you happen to listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate a review because it helps us to increase our overall profile. This episode, we are talking about post-traumatic stress disorder in light of the January 6th domestic terror attack on the Capitol. You're hearing about all the arrests that are being made, but you're starting now to hear about the experiences of some of the Congress people that were inside the Capitol when the attack happened. And we wanted to touch on the possibility of developing PTSD if their experiences weren't dealt with properly. Speaking of which, this country is currently dealing with its own PTSD, In fact, it's been dealing with it for the last 400 years. 400 years. 400 years. 400 years. More than 400 years of being treated different. slavery to Jim Crow to Emmett Till to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. And it's still happening today. We're still in 
this position. What did we do so wrong? Try to love us before you crush us. Still doesn't feel like home. If you truly want to understand us, then you have to learn about us from us. You have to feel our pain. Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head? You have head. to acknowledge to the souls of your what feet. we know. Try to love us. Because if you don't, we'll never grow as one. Open your heart. Because we can't take another 400 years. Post traumatic slavery syndrome. And the one thing that I am so sick and tired of hearing white people say is get over it. No it matter. Was so long ago. No matter when or what the occasion, they can't stop talking about slavery. And largely in a context of, hey, you know what? It isn't settled yet. Hey, you know what? We haven't fixed it yet. I mean, that's their starting point. And I think that's a no-win situation for us, because we've made great strides. This country has made phenomenal strides since then. Imagine that your wife has an affair, but you and your wife get together and you decide that you're going to forgive her. You're going to look past it for the sake of the marriage and your kids, and you move forward. He said, okay. Now imagine, sir, every argument you have, you continue to remind her that she's to blame for everything because she's the one that had the affair. I said, your relationship doesn't have a prayer if you can't let it go. If all you can do is continue to remind her what you've already forgiven her for, then the days of your relationship are over. And the grievance industry does, they don't want solutions. They want to be able to do just that, no matter what progress, no matter what agreements, no matter what, they don't want to acknowledge that anything has been done. And that's how I hear the Obamas. Well, it wasn't so long ago that you couldn't hear from actual slaves after slavery ended. Tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like for me, I can't. We've been slaves all our lives. My mother was a slave, sister was a slave, father was a slave. They know enough about reading right now. All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your missus. And it wasn't so long ago that the lasting effects of 400 years of trauma still affect America's black population. Last year, I had a chance to visit the Roots 101 African American Museum here in Louisville, Kentucky, where I had one of the most profound experiences in my entire life. All right, so these chains that I'm picking up, these are 400 years old. From Ghana. Mm -hmm. Hand restraints, neck restraints. Wow. Let's see, that's thirty five pounds. Right. Yeah. Imagine the heat off of them. Oh, man. I'm trying to kill your wife. Kids. That's just crazy. You know, and I'm, I'm holding these for the second time, and my heart is still beating out of my chest. It's like, it is, is, I don't know, there's a connection that when you pick them up, it's you feel every bit of the anxiety that 
your ancestor felt when they were put on him or her. Mm-hmm. And just think they didn't know where they were going. And they didn't they didn't know what these chains were, where they were going, why they were being put on. Um you can find that video on YouTube. Just search for Meeting My Ancestors. Seeing that video again had an even more profound effect on me because I recently got the results from an ancestral DNA test, and it turns out that I am from the region of Africa where those chains came from. So the anxiety that I talked about feeling, that trauma, is something that is passed down from generation to generation. Dr. Joy DeGuri explains. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on. And then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, And we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear long enduring trauma. I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields And a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's he's stupid. He's he's shiftless. He can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Post-traumatic slave syndrome, once again, is a trauma that gets passed down from generation to generation. Researchers in Africa have found that this trauma happens on a cellular level. One professor of psychiatry at Mount Sinai, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, conducted an in-depth research on how serious incidents of trauma, like slavery, can be passed down through generations in shared family genes. Her research reveals that when people experience trauma, it changes their genes. This change is then passed down to their children, continuing the cycle. The chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee, Kafra Kambon, said the trauma can sometimes make Africans distance themselves from their culture and the suffering their ancestors endured. He said the psychological and emotional damage done to those enslaved has left an untreated trauma. When we see certain patterns of behavior, uh, we treat them as racial characteristics as opposed to the effects of untreated trauma because we don't recognize our trauma. He 
He said for hundreds of years, the Africans experienced heavy amounts of trauma. The trauma is no longer as intense uh, because the physical brutality has been uh, taken out of the equation. At least as it existed then, and it's not all gone. But all kinds of psychological things are part of the machinery of a continued mental enslavement. Mr. Cambon said the trauma has also affected the way some in the diaspora look at themselves. Why is there a preference for, say, fair skin, people with fair skin? Why is there a preference for that? Why do people feel that there's something superior about white people? And these are, these are psychological realities in our society today. And it all has to do with that and the fact that all the things that inculcated those values, those beliefs, and all of that, those things are not addressed. Mr. Cambon said everything society has learned about Africa leans more to the negative side. He said there is a need to constantly educate the public on the positives. Most people with PTSD, whether they be combat veterans or people that have experienced a traumatic event, like that of the Capitol back on January 6th, get treated. But what happens when you have a trauma that goes untreated, especially one that's been around for over 400 years? We're unique as individuals. Everybody's not traumatized by a traumatic event, whether it's direct or not. But when we start talking about chattel slavery, we're not talking about one trauma. We're not talking about a specific event. We're talking about generations of trauma with no intervention. Based on what I know about sugar plantations, tobacco, the Caribbean, what I know about American chattel slavery and the plantations there, does anyone right now ever recall mental health assistance to slaves? Anybody remember sending in the therapist after I sold off your son, daughter, raped folks? Any, in, at any point? Never. Second question. After slavery was officially over, now you're free. Anybody any remember, remember any therapy then? We know it's been rough, it's been deep for you, it's been difficult, we're gonna do a little group therapy. Anybody remember that? That would be no. Number three, after slavery officially ended, both in the States, in the Caribbean, the British ended, do you remember whether or not trauma continued? Did the trauma continue for people of African descent? I need to know. Okay, so now let's do the math. Hundreds of years of trauma, no treatment. Freed, more trauma, no treatment. What do you do to math? Do you think there may be residual impacts of that trauma? Of course there is. It didn't end, friends, and it hasn't ended yet. So I think one, on one point, African people and people of African descent are extremely resilient. Matter of fact, I think we're a miracle. Far be it for us to pathologize or to look and cast this idea of weak and sick people. Oh, on the contrary, we are I'm profoundly resilient because we've done everything we've done thus far with no help. And so here we are, continuing to deal with a mental health issue that's been lingering for 400 years. And what America needs to realize is as long as we're mentally unhealthy as black people, things aren't going to be good for you as white people. After all, this is your original sickness. So with all the talk about unity and racial reconciliation, this is one more mess that you've got to clean up. So my question to you is, what's your prescription? You've been listening to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. The views expressed are those of the host and guests and not reflective of any business entity or anyone associated with this broadcast. If you have any comments or want more information on how to be a sponsor, log on to our website at markgunmedia.com or call us at 502-407-0283. That's 502-407-0283. Thank you for listening. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla, just damn.
damn good work.